Hello, everyone. I'm Frank Garza with Lean Startup Company, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the webcast. Today's topic is how McReber turns rubbish into rows, and moderating the discussion is our own Lean Startup Company faculty member, Elliot Suzel. Our guest is CEO of McReber, Toby McCartney, and with that, I'll hand things off to Elliot. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. We'll be meeting with Toby McCartney, the CEO and co-founder of McReber, a company he will have the pleasure of telling you all about. We're excited to learn about your journey. Welcome on the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. All right. So our agenda for today, um, I'd like to start by uh, learning a bit more about your company, what it does, and uh, how you ultimately went about exploring the, the business. Uh, and then I also want to then move into how you approach learning and sort of what people can take away as they consider potentially building a physical product in the real world, not just you know, a piece of technology. Uh, and then we'll co- sort of conclude with general advice for startup founders and also innovators within large organizations. How does that Great. sound? Yeah, sounds perfect. Let's do it. Awesome. So um, to kick things off, what, what does your company do? Yes. Okay. So uh, we take waste plastics. Uh, that's the plastics that are destined for landfill or incineration. The, the plastics that um, people see as rubbish that we throw away that can't be recycled. And we take those, we process them, and we use them to replace bitumen. So uh, black oily stuff that you get in an asphalt or in a road. So we, we basically take old rubbish and we turn it into roads. <laughs> okay, so taking old rubbish and turning it into roads, um, your bottom line is obviously more than just profit here. You're out to do some sort of good for society. Yeah, well, I think that's the future of business, really. It's um, the future of small businesses, anyway, is, uh, is to, to do good and to disrupt for, for good. Um, and that can be environmentally or, or socially or, or both, um, ideally. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a core theme in our business. It isn't just about profit, although we are obviously a profit-making business, um, but we are looking to clean up the world's uh, plastic epidemic, as we call it. Um, and that's the, that's the main thread, really, of our business. So did you just, like, roll out of bed one day and you're like, man, we've got to clean up the world's plastic? Like, how, how did that evolve? It doesn't quite happen like that. <laughs> it, um, it was something quite similar. It, it actually all started because uh, um, I was at my little girl's school assembly and um, the school assembly, each week the parents were invited in and so I went along and uh, you know, each week the kids, they, they either paint a picture or they, um, they perform some sort of act. This particular assembly was based on what lives in our oceans. Um, my little girl was six at the time and um, she did a, a little bit of research on Google, uh, um, uh, what lives in our oceans. And, she went along to the school assembly and all the parents were sat down waiting for to see what our kids had painted or drawn or whatever it might be. And I remember the teacher had, had gathered all the kids together and she said, so kids, what lives in our oceans? Um, and there were a few results, you know, one little girl put her hand up and she said, oh, well, fish, they live in our oceans, you know, the clever clogs in the class, you know. Um, and a few other answers, turtles, whales, dolphins, you know, those kind of things. Um, when it came around to my little girl's turn to to say what lives in her oceans, she turned around and she said, plastics. Ouch. Um, ah. and I, yeah, I had one of those moments, uh, similar to the teacher, she kind of took a step back and I, I don't think she was quite expecting the response. Uh-huh. Um, from my little girl, but uh, it was it was one of those moments, I think it's uh, something that happens to you as you get to be a parent, you, you suddenly uh, start to see the world differently. And I thought... I, well, I don't know about everyone watching, but I don't want my little girl or, or little girls or little boys, uh, the next generation growing up in a world where um, it's expected that the research that my little girl did is expected that there is, in, in, by the time my little girl is my age, so I'm the grand old age of 41, 
um, by the time she's my age, it's expected that there will be more plastics living in our oceans than fish themselves. Um, I don't want that to be the case. So I thought, well, I, I'd like to do something about it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what that is, but, um, or I didn't know what that was, but uh, I wanted to do something about it. And um, then on the other side, I, um, I spent uh, quite a bit of time working with a, a charity out in India. And uh, I had I'd seen what uh, sort of pains that they went through. I was working actually with a group of people they call pickers. Um, and a, a picker's job is to go to landfill sites and pick out various different items that could be recycled. Uh, much of those items that they found were plastics and they would, they would take uh, like Ribena cartons or juice cartons and they, were, they would collect them. They, they would then put them together and glue them or sew them together to form wallets and purses and various other things. I thought this is just brilliant. This is something that we could do with the, the plastics that we've got in the world. Um, one of the other things that they were doing is uh, they, like the rest of the world, they have a pothole problem, um, as in there's lots of holes in their road, just like in the UK, like in the States, like all over the world. But um, theirs is perhaps worse than ours, as in most of the people I was with in India, they were driving around on tuk-tuks and mopeds yeah. and bikes. And um, when those things hit a pothole, it can be the difference between life and death literally wow um, what they were doing is they were taking this stuff from landfill they were putting it into these potholes they were pouring diesel all over it lighting it and then all the stuff was melting down to form a seal in the hole and i thought that's what i'll do with all the plastics that we've got sitting in landfill um, now it turns out that my local authority and many local authorities they kind of frown upon us, um, setting light to things that we put into potholes. Um, so you I had can't to just go light stuff on the street on fire. That's not allowed where you live. That was it. You know, it's just uh, yeah, the council wouldn't let me do it. So um, <laughs> uh, I had this crazy idea that well, what if I, if there was a way to take these waste plastics um, to mix them in with asphalt. Um, I, my, my background in, uh, my very limited background in chemistry taught me that uh, plastics are made from oil. They come from oil. They're uh, um, hydro, hydrocarbons, so hydrogen and carbons, um, as is bitumen, oil. Um, it comes from hydrocarbons. So I wondered if there was a way to mix these two things together to replace, if you like, you know, bitumen with plastics. Um, I got together with a couple of mates and um, I said, I've got this crazy idea. What do you think? Um, they took a bit of convincing. They thought I was completely crazy, but um, they came on board and we, we spent 18 months of trials and tests and uh, just giving it a go, see if we could get something that worked. And those 18 months, were you sort of maintaining a full-time job while you were exploring this? Okay. Yes, yes, a full-time job, uh, parenting, um, all the rest. Which is another full-time job. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and so at that at that point, had you raised any capital, or is this just we're exploring it, we're seeing what can be done? Um, yeah. At that point, we were we put in our own money, so we um we we thought that we had something. We we kind of we had an inkling that there might be something in it. Um, although everybody that we were talking to, we, that we said, well, <laughs> we've got this crazy idea. We're going to take plastics and put them into roads to make them better. Um, everyone said that we were crazy. Uh -huh. um, but we put yeah. in uh, a, a certain sum, life savings, into this idea. Um, and we sent various different forms of different plastics that we'd grouped together down to a lab. Um, and we, we spent all of our money on just getting it tested. Um, the first... I think it was the first £10,000 that we put in, um, we spent on, on the patent so that we could protect, if, if indeed we did have anything at that time, we thought, well, we better protect it. Um, and then we just tested and we tested and we tested until we finally got a result. Um, it was maybe 800 times of different testing that, that didn't work out, but we finally struck plastic. <laughs> and it worked. So... Um a couple of things that I think would be really interesting to talk about here. One is um, 
sort of the approach that you took to exploring this idea, which was very much seeing, can we even create this thing in the first place? Yeah. Another approach to have taken, and maybe you were doing some of this at the same time, is let's pretend we could make it. Could we even sell it, assuming we could make it, right? To yeah. see if like the market would even exist to sell the product if you were in fact able to make it. Um, yeah. To, to be honest, it was, a, it was a labor of love before we even thought that we could sell anything. Um, it was more, is it possible, uh, rather than can we make money out of it? Um, it was a, um, it's, it started, it still is, but it, it started very much as just a, uh, an experiment. Is there something that we could do that would use up the waste plastics? Um, and, and originally the idea was just to use up the waste plastics from the oceans. So mm -hmm. that was, um, that was the, the whole plan. We would take plastics from the oceans and we would use them to fill potholes. Um, and at first we, we thought that we could just sort of melt it down or, or form a, a sort of a pothole filler with, with this uh, random plastic that we found. Um, and it, it wasn't until maybe 18 to 20 months after starting this project um, that we, we realized that there could be something in it that that could form a business and not just a not just a hobby and mm -hmm. and a you know a, some a discussion point between the three of us. Got it. Okay, so what I find interesting here is that um, for many organizations and for many new companies, the question is really not can we build it, right? The the tech risk of can it be built, can it be created is low. But in in this case, that is. Uh, not true at all. The question of could we build it was, we, we actually don't know. We need to figure that out first. Yeah. Um, and what I find interesting is that you sort of shifted focus from, we're going to fill in potholes to like, hey, wait a minute. Like, could, it sounds like, could we make roads using yeah. this instead of some other materials? Um, yeah. Well, you know, we, we the, the, uh, the whole business was built around um, what we saw as two world problems. There's the, the plastic epidemic that the world sees that we live through today. Um, and, and to be honest, that pissed us off. It, that was, that was, it, was a, it was a frustration that, um, that drove us to create something. Um, and then on the other side, uh, we're, we're all from, um, or we all now live in Scotland, and uh, the road quality in Scotland has deteriorated beyond belief. Uh, and that's not just Scotland, uh, that's throughout the world. It's, yeah. um, and again, that we, we developed this frustration over these two world problems that we, we just combined these two world problems in one simple solution. The yeah. solution was almost secondary to the two problems that we were trying to solve, you know? But, yeah, and, and so what, what really struck me there is the sort of motivation that you had I was at an event just yesterday uh, coaching some startup founders and I had to light a fire under a few of them to say like, Hey, look, like if you don't move the needle yeah. for this thing, like no one else is going to do it. If you're the CEO and you're the only person at the company, right? Like for, yeah, exactly. for baby, baby startups. Right. Um, yeah. And what I found interesting is that like you had this motivation um, to solve both of these problems, both the road quality and the, the plastic epidemic highlighted so profoundly by your daughter. So um, talk to me a little bit, you know, if we were talking about like a pure technology play, one way you might go find customers or um, see if your customers are interested in your service, you could do all kinds of neat little experiments like a landing page test um, where you can rapidly see like, are people actually interested in this thing? That I've envisioned. And I know a landing page test is not the per most perfect way of going and exploring something. Um, but sort of how did you find your customers engage whether or not people were actually interested in, in what it was that you were doing? Um, I think, you know, I, I have a, a simple theory that wherever you find a pain um, and you can provide a gain for that pain, you you have an audience. Um, you've just got to go out and look for those pains and disrupt what what might be seen as the norm um, to create a new type of gain. 
So I really think, you know, there are, there are sort of um, two types of business. Um, one is to create something brand new that's not been thought of before. I think that's difficult. I think that's a challenge. Um, and the other side is to do something that you think doesn't work and make it better. Um, and that's a much easier business to go into. So we could see two things that we found don't work. It doesn't work that we have waste plastics trashing our ocean and, and our landfill sites. And um, it doesn't work that the quality of, of the roads that we drive on anywhere in the world is getting worse. Um, and that we're, we're putting our, our cars through, this, um, through the potholes. I mean, a anyone that is sitting at work watching this will have driven through maybe 20 potholes to get to, to their work. Or if they're watching it at home, 20 potholes to get back back home um i don't think that that should be the way it is so i you know i i think it's it's driven from this this frustration to um to create something that that does work that is better but, um, yeah it, it, you know. well what i find interesting here is that frequently when advising someone who's exploring something whether you're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur starting your own thing um you've got to validate that the problem is real Right. And for you, like you have found a very, very real problem. And so, so the next thing that you might go explore is, does this solution solve this problem? And specifically for the, the sort of customers that we want to work with. So to that end, um, who are the, the customers of your business? Yeah, well, we uh, we stimulate the growth of the business through uh, through the local authorities, through um, the, the the councils, um, through the road owners. So uh, the, the the people that own the roads, they they don't become our customer, but they become the stimulus for the the growth behind our business. We we actually sell our products to the asphalt manufacturing industry. So they're the the people that make asphalt um, mm -hmm. that. Uh, Often they import bitumen from elsewhere and they, they use that bitumen as a, as a glue to stick stone together. That's all the road really is. Um, it's slightly more complex than just that, but um, it's what we have if, if, if we're using um, sort of play glue at the moment, what we have is super glue. Um, so we get to stick that stone together much more effectively and efficiently than, than they currently do. Um, but we only sell our products. So we have four different products, uh, four different mixes of various different plastics that go together to form four um, mixes that do various different things to roads. And we only sell those products into the asphalt manufacturing industry. So our clients, our customers are a small group of, uh, of companies. Yeah. It's, uh, it makes life a lot easier. Yeah. No, well, e easier in, because you have those relationships, um, but it's tricky if you're just breaking in, like, you know, the, if your audience is only five customers in the whole world, like you really better convince those five customers, depending yeah, on your model, that's, right? That's, maybe maybe that's, what we, that's what we found really in our business. We, we didn't just go straight to market to sell. Um, we had to educate before we get to sell. So it took us longer to, to sell anything because we, we had to go to our potential customers, educate them in what it is that we've got and educate our, you know, the stimulus, the, the growth through the local authorities because no one had ever heard of this. So yeah. it was, uh, you know, the, the new aspect of it, we were having to say, well, these are the problems. You might not have known that you've had these problems, but, um, but they are very real for you. Um, and we have a solution for them. So yeah. it was an education first. Education is very tough. I've, I've talked with some number of startups, you know, uh, founders that said, well, you know, we just got to teach our customers that they have this problem. And, you know, if you're trying to teach thousands or tens of thousands of hundreds of millions of people that they have this problem, that's really hard to teach someone they have a problem. Um, yeah. But because you're working with a small number of customers and like, look, edu educating people about the challenge of, plastics and their inability to decompose and where we're putting them, you know, there's a lot of people already doing a lot of that education for you. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that's the difference that makes the difference in, in businesses for the future. 
um, especially small businesses that are starting right now, if you, I think any business that starts today that is looking to be progressive and, um, and still here in, in 10 to 20 years time, I think they must involve some sort of environmental or social aspect. And that is gonna require, um, because it's not just about finance, it's not just about cash in, um, it's, how, it's not just about how much we sell and how much we take back, it's, um, there's a bigger goal. And that bigger goal often requires a, an education that sits behind it. It isn't just a, a financial transaction. Um, but I, I think businesses that are here to disrupt the world, and, and that's certainly what our business is here to do, um, it, they often, uh, most often, require some education into what it is that we are disrupting. So um, what is the incentive for one of your customers to switch from using whatever they're doing today? Because I know, you know, uh, entrepreneurs who are trying to create a sort of better alternative to an existing product um, sometimes struggle getting customers to make that mind shift of like, oh, yeah, I need to upgrade or switch to whatever this other solution is. Yeah, well, we have sort of a, a different sales pitch depending on who we're who we're talking to. So for our local authorities, what is a, again, you know, if you find their pain, you can sell in the gain. So it's always finding what's their biggest pain. Um, often in the world, uh, the world that we live in today, it's um, finance is a, is a big pain for, for everybody, right? So if you can make your products cheaper than your competitors, then you 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 know there's there's a game right so that's that's one thing so because we're taking a waste product that nobody has any value for and we're using that to replace bitumen which has a is an oil base so it's a high expense we can make our products cheaper for the asphalt manufacturers than than the, the currently what they're buying um, from a local authorities perspective or a road owner they want their roads to last longer. So by replacing bitumen with, with plastics or our mix of plastics, um, the roads last longer, less maintenance, um, less potholes, of course, and therefore they don't have to replace those roads as often as they do. They save a lot of money in the long run. And yeah. also they often in many countries, they have a, a landfill uh, tax bill to pay. So for every ton of waste that, that companies or people throw away, um, they or councils throw away they have a, a, a tax to pay on that ton of waste so um, we can take those plastics often for free sometimes we're paid to take them from from various different companies but of course we take them and we're paid less than the landfill tax bill so we save the money that way yeah so just always looking I think for the pains and then matching your sales pitch if you call it a sales pitch but your your patter around your products into what is it that they most need and then getting to sell on what they most need yeah well i i find it so interesting that you keep putting emphasis back on the pain and the gain and i feel like if our viewers took away this sort of one idea right that might be it that if you can find a real pain and, and solve for that in a meaningful way and continually sort of validate, yes, this pain is real. And yes, like this solution actually helps with this pain. It'll, it'll really go a long way. So yeah, well, that's, um, that's the, the, the whole um, title of entrepreneur. There's many people that banter about the title, I'm an entrepreneur, but a, an entrepreneur's job is very much like a like a doctor but not obviously with within the medical profession often um is we're there to take away those pains and supply in the benefits the um you know the the paracetamol for the the pains in business you know that's what makes a real entrepreneur and i think um you know the the whole title of entrepreneur is there to to disrupt for good and to create things that make life easier make things better um help us progress as a as human beings and that's that's what for me anyway the title the title means yeah so um i want to explore this idea a little more of sort of when you were getting started um and as you were sort of figuring out like it is there even a real 
solution here. Um, talk to me a little bit about some of the experimentation you were doing, right? So for instance, everyone's probably heard this phrase of like fail fast, right? But what we really mean is learn fast. Um, I imagine when you're doing work with a lab, like those cycles can be pretty long. And when the results come back in a way that is not in your favor, right? Like that, I don't know, did you get directional feedback in that situation that gets you closer to the right answer? What was that experimentation process like for you? No, it's very much like school really. Um, it, was, uh, it was a pass or fail um, and often I failed. Um, <laughs> It was uh, just the way it went. Um, I, I, you know, I've, I've, it's, uh, I, I always think I, I always, it's just the way that my mind works is when someone sets a task, I always, you know, think that there is a way to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, when we got the first few failures in, I thought, well, um, you know, the, the lab didn't write to us and say, this is ridiculous. We're not going to take your money. Um, for these tests because this is just never going to happen. So I thought, well, somewhere down the line, we'll find the result. Um, you know, the, the challenge that we had was, you know, most people see, they don't necessarily understand if you take a plastic bottle, they just think that that's a bit of plastic that you can remold into another plastic bottle and it should be easy. Um, unfortunately, um, for the world of recycling, it isn't easy. Um, there's yeah. three different plastics within one bottle. And I, I think that, um, and now I didn't know that before I came into um, starting Kriba, it, it was not, not I, I had no idea that there were three different polymer or, or even different plastics. I thought plastic was just plastic, right? Um, so the world of recycling had the problem of they have to separate all of those. So the wrap that you get on a, on a say a plastic water bottle the, whatever the brand is, that's a different type of plastic to the bottle itself, which again is a different type of plastic to the lid that you get. Um, and I found this fascinating. What an interesting concept that you can't just take a plastic bottle and just melt it down and form another plastic bottle. You've got to separate it first and then put it back together like a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. Um, and so uh, much of our, our early research was just in what do those plastics actually do? And why would you need three different plastics to form a plastic bottle that then you can sell, you know, out with your water or your, your product in it? Um, and so it was, it was a real learning for us all. We had no experience of roads, um, very little experience really in the world of construction between the three of us or chemistry between the three of us. Um, certainly not within roads and asphalt and bitumen and stone and or we call it aggregates because that makes us sound like we know what we're talking about. Um, and, and within plastics, you know, no experience. But yeah. it was just a learning curve and it gave us a, a commonality that between the three of us sitting in a pub every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday night talking about this, uh, this concept, it gave us something to talk about and it, it built a real friendship up. Yeah. So I think that, that sort of drove us to, to keep it going. Yeah. I remember in the early days, we would always have the phrase, surely someone's already thought of this and surely someone's already trialed this and it's not worked. And that's why it's not out there in the world. And that was our biggest fear. It wasn't not being able to sell it. It was that we wouldn't be able to meet on a Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday in the pub to talk about it. That was the, that was the real problem that we had at the beginning. So we just kept it going and kept it going and we, we enjoyed the, the journey. So to that end, um, what sort of exploration did you do around how this idea had been pursued in the past or if it was being done anywhere else? How did you explore those existing alternatives when you were just getting started? Yeah, well, we, we did a, you know, the usual Google search is, is anybody thinking about this? Is anybody doing this? Um, and of course we didn't find anything. And then we, we, um, or I applied for the initial patent that we had, and um, they, they, when you apply for a patent, they, they sort of do a, a search, or you can pay to have a search done, and no, nobody had it. Um, so I thought, well, this, this is good news. You know, this is this. It's either it's either really good news or it's really bad news. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I went for the good news option, 
And, um, you know, there were things that were going on as we did further research. There's a company, I, I think, based in Holland that were taking waste plastics and forming uh, prefabricated roads, which was a, a great idea. I really, I really like it. I don't think that the business worked out because like a concrete road, if you, you've got to build them in slabs and where you get joins, you get, you get problems in those joins. Wow. So they, it, it didn't kind of work out. And of course, I, I knew about the stuff that they were doing in India where they were taking old rubbish and shoving it down in potholes. Um, but again, it, it, you know, we wouldn't be able to get away with that in uh, certainly in the UK where I'm based. And um, we've got our first road going down in the States uh, on the 10th of September. So I'll be, I'll be over, ah. uh, over with that. So it's really exciting times for us. Um, but we, you know, we, we wanted to meet the certain standards that you get from all over the world. And it was, um, it was, it, we saw it as a challenge, uh, yeah. um, and nobody else was, was doing it. So the door was wide open for us. Um, and so, was, you know, you, you had this concern, which is like, well, geez, the, maybe this is bad because it's just not possible. Um, to get a sense, are we talking about like dozens of attempts with the lab? Or, you know, um, I, I would say over, uh, over 800 attempts. Over 800 not... attempts. Yeah, yeah. This 800. is like with the light bulb, right? <laughs> Testing all the filaments. And... There, were, there were over um, 800 tests that were done with maybe um, three or 400 different mixes of polymers. So um, the, the bit that we have is it's a bit like making a cake. If you put too much sugar in, the cake tastes awful. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to have the right amount of sugar, the right amount of eggs, the, you know, the right amount of milk or whatever it is that you're putting in. Um, and that was, that was the trick. It was making the right cake that tastes just right for the roads. Um, and it was, it, that took, yeah, three or 400 attempts and then wow. 800 tests um, that came from those attempts. Um, and then we finally, I, I remember the call to this day, they called me up and said, I think you've got something here. <laughs> so I, I, I nearly, wow. on a, I was down in London on the Thames, I nearly jumped into the Thames, I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously this took t some amount of persistence. Um, yes. And you know, each of these tests, I, you send it off to the lab and you just sort of have to wait for the results, right? Yeah, well, we, we, we were using our own money as well. So, you know, our wives weren't so happy with us. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh <laughs> That's got to be agonizing, right? And, and the uncertainty is very... Uh, mm. and, and so um, how do you manage your psychology as you're doing something like that, right? So you're spending your own money, a bunch yeah. of your own time. And it sounds like you're having some fun with, with you know, the, the co-founders you've chosen. And that's sort of a whole separate topic of how do you choose the right people to be working with there. But, but how do you uh, stay dedicated and strong and focused in this situation where like, you don't know if there's a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow or if you're even at, on a rainbow at all? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, some people spend a lot of money on hobbies like golf or uh, fishing or I don't, yeah. I don't have any of those hobbies. I, I don't um, I, I don't spend my money on gambling. Um, I you know so there's I I really enjoy the 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 challenge. If so, I was um, I, I guess my wife put up with that uh, initially, um, and it was the challenge that we wanted to see out. It was you know, and this sounds cheesy and this sounds corny, but something definitely happens to you as you as you become a parent and you start to not necessarily think just about yourself. Um, and I used to be just like that. I would just think about me and me was all that mattered. Um, but then, you know, it was, it was, can we actually do something that does actually make a difference that, that we can pass on, that we can, we can say, Oh, we, we made that mark. We did something that actually did make a difference for our kids and for the next generation. And that's, um, that was worth spending the, the 40 or 50,000 pounds that we each put into the, the business in the early days. Yeah, so, so not a cheap investment at all. And so um, to that end, how did you handle, and maybe I should start with, did you encounter and how did you handle situations where, you know, 
you, you get results back from an experiment and you're, it's not clear what the next step might even be. It didn't work and like it, there weren't any clear indicators that you're headed in the right direction or ha how do you handle that situation? Yeah, that still happens today. <laughs> um, I don't think that stops. Um, I just think you become uh, maybe more comfortable with it. I, th I think there's a certain point, you go through a certain point where you realize that the business will be successful even with all the downsides. I think back in the early days when something negative happened, we would think, you know, my, uh, my colleague, uh, Nick Burnett, he, he would often say, oh, and he would use, a, use the F words, where we've got nothing, he would say some stuff like that. Um, we, and looking back, they, they seem like minor things that happened. Um, but we, we, all, we all somehow, I guess, knew that it wasn't the end. I, I remember once we, we had a, a mix back that really didn't work out, and um, we'd had some negative feedback from, from one of our potential clients, um, that said, oh, this isn't going to work. And I remember um, it was actually Gordon Reed. He called the meeting and we'd go into, it, the meeting was in his living room um, and it set out the, the wine and the beer and I knew this was going to be a long meeting. Um, <laughs> and we all went in and I, I was thinking, this is, this is it, you know, this is going to be it. We're, you know, we, we haven't got anything and we've, we've spent all this money and it's all, it's not gone well. Um, and somehow just when we, we got together and we, we just managed to pull through it and look at the, the positives, there's, um, you know, I, for me, it's a bit like uh, in an ideal world, you would get from A to B in one straight line and it would be nice and easy. Um, but, you know, everyone knows when they go on holiday, um, it's, you know, you get on the plane and ideally the plane would just get you straight there and it'd be brilliant. Um, but when you get up there, the plane hits some turbulence. And I think the businesses that don't work out, that, that don't succeed, are those that hit the turbulence and then they stop. They just mm. think, well, this hasn't worked. I'm, I'm not going to get there. Um, but those that believe, and I, I have a, a useful belief that I hold by, that there is no failure. There is only feedback. And I think if you can take that feedback and you can um, move through that turbulence, there's always a way around it, under it, through it. There's always a way to get to that end destination. And I think we three in Macriba, we were just lucky that we three all believe that. Um, even when the worst things happen, uh, there's no failure, only feedback. It's, it's a rule that I live by. Yeah. Um, so did, did any of those uh, experiments that you did with the lab come back as like a true catastrophic failure? Yeah, most of them. <laughs> okay, so, so, the, so the key here is that- A lot of turbulence. Yeah, so, so if you can learn as you're going along, right? So, so it didn't work, but each time, hopefully you were picking up some new amount of information that might yeah. point you in the right direction. Yeah. So as long as you're learning yeah. um, and you can see some other path forward, uh, yeah, yeah you're headed in a good direction and maybe you're yeah, just I mean, the lab results that came back they would always say oh it's uh it's not worked because it's been too um too weak in the mix or it's it's not been as uh as, as strong in the mix or whatever it might have been so then you go back to the books you go back to the research and you think well w what polymers are out there then that would if we added a little bit of that in that would make it stronger or would make it more flexible or um, so you know we within the polymer groups the plastic groups you've, you've maybe got 200 different types of plastics yeah uh, each with their own sort of varying categories of grade and, and quality um, and so it was just a trial and error but when you've got 200 of something you've got ample opportunity to take you know, it's, it's like uh, like an artist to get the right color, to get the, the exact right mix of colors. They might try, you know, a red, a yellow and a blue and mix it together. But if that doesn't quite create the right color, then they add in a bit more yellow or they add in a bit more red until they're happy with the color. And that's exactly the same, I think, in business. You you take the feedback and you, you make it better. So to that end, um, 
you had a chemistry background. Would you say it's more important that you had the chemistry background or that you were busting your chops, sort of learning as you were going? Uh, no, so when I said I had a chemistry background, I um, read a, a GCSE chemistry book about a year ago. Um, <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a low grade uh, chemistry book. That's okay. my only I don't okay. have any formal qualifications. Okay. Actually. So, I didn't so it is the grit then. It, it's your hard work as the founder of the company, right? Working through the uncertainty and the unknown. And, and, yeah, and you know, would you, would you have imagined that this is what you would be working on and learning about, you know, no, 10 years ago? Not, no, you know, absolutely not. Um, my old uh, school motto, so we used to have to wear a school uniform with a blazer and there was a, a lion on, the, on the, the pocket and underneath the lion, it said, uh, nil sin labor. Um, which is uh, Latin for nothing without hard work. And um, I, throughout my life, leaving school without any qualifications, I, I've, I've tried the odd thing to, to try and make money quick and all of these schemes that are out there. And I, I really believe Nelson Labor, nothing without hard work. There is no, there's no quick fix to anything in life. And unless you're prepared to do the hard work and the graft, you're, you, you shouldn't certainly call yourself an entrepreneur and you should go and get a job. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So I, I like this and this is really good segue sort of into the advice and, and sort of closing portion of the, the show today, um, which is some advice for founders or those who are within large companies pursuing big ideas. Um, to get a sense, right, how many hours a week did you spend working on this as something in addition to your day job and being a, a parent? Um, well, I, well, one week I did calculate my hours and I'd worked 120 hours <laughs> on, on one week. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't do that every week, um, but I, I've trained myself to not need or, or certainly I, I don't get as much sleep as, as many people I know. You know, some people, I, they say I need nine or 10 hours sleep. Um, I think my body would, would feel like I'd died if I had nine or, or 10 hours sleep. Um, yeah. uh, so, um, I, I sort of train myself to, to wake up early. I get most of my work done very early in the mornings. Yeah. Um, really i really i like that i like that time in the morning um uh i'm a bit of a, a tv addict as well so I, I go to bed a little bit late but um i could probably give that up uh <laughs> yeah but, um, i well, like got on, got on my time is is I, I stick the uh you know netflix or whatever it might be on and i i zone out i i quite enjoy that yeah but um yeah, it's uh, so I, I maybe get four or five hours a night sleep and that that is enough for me. I, I feel good on that. And, um, you know, it's, it's the mornings that work for me. So, yeah. Well, so the, the message to people who are exploring a new idea is that like, look, um, it's going to be a lot of work, potentially a whole heck of a lot of work, 120 hours. I, you know, I imagine that's a peak week. Right. But um yeah, and initially I, I think, it's a labor um, of love and you don't know whether or not it's going to be successful. So yes. um, I probably do on an average week about uh, 90 hours. Um, um, but the, the difference is it's not what I call work. It's, it's not like having to go to an office. I mean, at the moment I'm, I'm out in Turkey and we, we've got some roads going down out here. So I'm having a bit of a holiday while I'm working. Uh, what I love about being in Turkey is we're two hours ahead of the UK. So when I wake up at four or five in the morning, I get all of my emails done for that day, all of my admin, before the guys at home are waking up. It's, um, Amazing. You know, it's great. You've got the freedom. And that's what business builds or gives to me is the freedom to sleep when you want and, and to work when you want. But um, it's certainly not the easy way. If you're looking for an easy route into making money, go get a job. <laughs> and um, uh, is there any sort of other advice you would give to someone who's considering starting a business? I think, uh, you know, be prepared for, the, um, for everybody that you know that you've, you've loved all of your life or you've admired all of your life to tell you that your idea is never going to work and it's going to be the worst thing that you're ever going to do um, and be prepared for that. Um, but I, I think when you break through that and you can 
I think if you've got a passion for something, if you can create that passion around, as I say, something that is actually going to do good or disrupt for good. And I think it's, you know, I always liken business and my wife probably doesn't like me saying this, but it's got to be like having a love affair. Um, you're just not with another person, right? So um, if you can have that love affair with your business and you can spend as much time as you, as you do with your business as with your, your partner, the person that you love, then um, you've got a good chance of it being a success. Nice. I love it. So uh, to summarize some of the advice and takeaways, um, as you are exploring something new, um, focus on the pain, the real problem, and the gain. Who is going to benefit by virtue of creating this solution? And what really is the benefit to that group or set of customers? Uh, and I loved your metaphor of sort of operating like a doctor. You're a doctor, but you know, not for physical pains necessarily, but for whatever those uh, real felt problems might be. And then as you're moving, it may not be easy. I loved the expression, uh, Nilsen Labor, is that, is that right? Right, right. like nothing without hard work. So you'll probably face critics. Yes. It's not gonna be easy. You're probably gonna face setbacks. And you know, 90 to 120 hours a week, like, look, not every startup is going to take that much effort, but many will. And uh, you've got to really be prepared to, to work hard. And to that end, you know, hopefully it's something you really love and are passionate about, because that's a lot of time to spend trying to force yourself to work on something if you're not all that passionate about it. Yeah, you know, I go, I go with five principles just as a, as a last bit of my advice, if you like, but five yeah. principles. First is, in any business, you've got to get people to know you. Okay, that's where marketing comes in. So go to a, a, an expert in marketing and they'll, they'll help you market it. Then what businesses used to do is they, they jump straight to point number four. They get people to know them through marketing. Then they would try and sell to them. I think there's two other bits that will go into the five principles that you should concentrate on. Get people to know you through your marketing, but then get people to like you. But that's not enough now just to like you, to know you to like you before they buy from you, number four. You've got to get people after they like you to trust you. So you've got to get people to know you, like you, trust you. Then they'll buy from you. But that's not where you make most of your money in business. You make your money from the fifth principle. If they know you, they like you, they trust you, then they bought from you, then they go and refer you. That's free marketing then all of the money that you're spending on principle number one, you can reduce that because they'll be referring you on. And you don't need, I don't think, expensive referral schemes. If you, if you concentrate on point number two and three, you talk about your business with passion, you try and solve people's problems, they'll like you and they'll get to trust you if you're just who you are without all of these business acronyms and all of this um, you know, the books that you read on how to start a business, go and be yourself within it. Then people will buy from you and then they'll refer you. And that's, if you stick to those five, I think that will work. Nice. And um, I'll sort of build off of that, which is um, this entire process for you involves a lot of experimentation. And, yeah. and it, especially because you were working on a physical product where we were uncertain how to even make it work, right? Um, and, and to use a sort of metaphor, many entrepreneurs, what they would do is they would say, I've got this idea and, and you know, you ran, a, you, know, you said up to 800 different tests, right? Instead of running all those tests, what they do is they pick the first thing as their chemical compound and they just build it and they try to sell it. And then when it doesn't work, they're, they're shocked, they're surprised, right? Um, yeah. So... The, the iterations and the, and the testing is super, super relevant as you move along. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Toby, for joining us. Um, if you'd like to learn more about uh, Toby and, and his business, where, where can we learn about you? Yeah, just go along to our website. We're mccreever.com. That's uh, the reason we're called McCreever is uh, my surname is McCartney, Toby McCartney. Um, also got a TED talk. Have a look at the TED talk uh, if you like. If you type my name into Google, you'll find it. 
um, McCartney, so that's the Mac. My business partner is Gordon Reed, that's the Re. And the Nick Burnett is the Burr, so MacReeandBurr.com. Amazing. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about Lean Startup or you have any questions at all about the, the podcast that we've had today, uh, send me a message at Elliot, E-L-L-I-O-T, at leanstartup.co. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining, and we'll see you next time. All the best.